Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. The Department of Health and Human Services recently partnered with the University of South Carolina to help combat the growing child and adolescent mental health crisis. Health and Human Services Communications Director Jeff Liritz joins us to discuss the new School Behavioral Health Academy. But first, this past September, the Violence Policy Center released its When Men Murder Women study. And for only the second time since its release in 1998, South Carolina was not in the top 10. Sarah Barber, Executive Director of the South Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, joins us to talk about what needs to be done to protect people from becoming victims. Sarah, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So Sarah, let's start with the latest data on domestic violence in our state. The Violence Policy Center found that in 2020, South Carolina ranked 23rd in the country when it comes to the number of women murdered by men. Uh, that was 41 women in 2020, or 1.52 per 100,000 women. So we went from six from in the year prior to 23rd. Is that encouraging? Is it still troublesome? Or is it all pretty much relative, in your opinion? I think it's always good news when you see data like that. Any improvement is good news. And obviously, that's fewer people who lost their lives that year. But it was 2020. It was the beginning of the pandemic. That's a very unusual year. And if you look at the data across all the states, you'll see some states the rate went way up, some states it went way down from compared to previous years. So I think what we're going to have to look at is the pattern of how that starts to play out in years to come, whether that was the start of a trend or whether that was a blip in a year where who knows what was going on. So I do take encouragement from it always. You know, when you do this work, you always have to keep that hope alive. But I do think we need to be cautious and not jump to any conclusions about what that data truly says about whether things are improving or not in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Because that was a concern when we talked last year and in years prior just about, you know, were you expecting more troubling numbers because of the pandemic, because of, you know, creating such a unique situation for people to be, you know, even more so trapped in so I guess somewhat encouraging, but still you think there could be more behind that data? Yeah, and so that's lethality data. And we were surprised by the fact that we dropped down. And when I talked with somebody at the National um, Domestic Violence Fatality Review Initiative out in Arizona, they were surprised by our data too, mm. because it was not what they were seeing in other parts of the country. But what we still know is that there's you know 25,000 incidents of domestic violence reported to law enforcement approximately each year and so that's still going on and during the pandemic I think there were probably more that weren't reported so I don't know that we'll ever get a true picture of what domestic violence really looked like during that time. 25,000 reports a year in South Carolina? Yes to so. law enforcement and in an underreported crime yeah. so um, the numbers really are staggering. Mm -hmm. When we look at that data, and I don't know, again, if we're, we're still trying to understand it, but when you look at the laws that were passed previously and years previous, do you think maybe that's helping affect those numbers, or do you think that we're seeing some changes as a result of those laws that were passed? I would hope so, but I think it's also very different to parse out. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been number six, well, we've had since those laws have changed, we've been number three since those laws have changed, and now we're number 23 mm -hmm. in lethality. Um, the numbers and incidents reported stay around the same. Our member organizations are still fielding around 15,000 hotline calls every year. Mm -hmm. We're still providing shelter to around 3,500 women and their children every year. And we're still providing you know, thousands of people with community-based services. So we still have a huge problem here. And the criminal justice system and the laws that, that run through are only one aspect of what we're dealing with. Um, domestic violence is in many ways like an octopus in that its tentacles go through every system. They go through housing, they go through medical, they go through mental health, um, they go through people looking for work. I mean, there's just so many ways. And I think we concentrate so much on the criminal justice system that sometimes we forget there's a whole sort of big shadow, um, endemic level of domestic violence that we may not be seeing in those numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll talk more about what it takes to get out of these situations, and I know how difficult it is because we've talked about mm -hmm. that before, and you brought up a lot of good points about how just so many facets there are when it comes to these situations that we have to deal with, especially women in these situations. Uh, before we get there, I want to ask you just about, you know, how we get to this problem in the first place. You know, we were talking about seeing record drug overdose deaths in 2020. We see increased rates of alcohol use and abuse. 
Uh, we have mental health problems. We have a system that's somewhat broken. Can you talk to us about how addiction, substance abuse, and just all of this kind of plays into what creates domestic violence in the first place in our state? So I don't think those are causal factors, mm -hmm. but I think they are very sort of, um, they are intricately involved. They're correlates of what we're looking at. Um, alcohol and drug abuse can um, turn what might be an argument into a violent incident because people's um, defenses are lowered, people's um, self-control is lowered, and so that often leads to violence not only in domestic violence but in other um, violent crimes too. Um, mental health is the same way. I mean, I think what we have in this state and in many states is sort of this toxic brew of so many different things that come together to um, create levels of violence in our homes that really undermine the lives of victims and their children and so become intergenerational in effect. Mm -hmm. And that kind of brought, brings up a thing I was talking about when it comes to creating healthy relationships and what a healthy relationship is, especially now when we talk about the term toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. That's something that's really kind of gotten more awareness and we're talking about, you know, what it means to be a man, you know, not being able to show emotion. That's that phrase that toxic masculinity kind of encapsulates there. Uh, so what is up with the, the, what's up with the misunderstanding there, I guess, when it comes to, you know, having communications with families to have healthy relationships for children. What needs to be said? What do parents need to be on the lookout for so they can maybe break this cycle? I know it's difficult when you're raised in a family there when there is domestic violence, but if you're trying to prevent your child from becoming an abuser in some way or thinking that, oh, this is what it means to be a man instead of, no, you can have an actual healthy relationship with a female. Uh, what do parents need to know about these situations? So I think first of all, those relationships and how we learn about love and how we show love in relationships does start within our sort of nuclear family, within the home. But we also have to look at what our culture tells us and that social media is telling us mm -hmm. and the influences that, have, that has on people's um, perceptions of what a relationship is. I think we really need to make a much heavier investment in prevention to do healthy relationship works in schools. I know sometimes mm -hmm. people don't want schools to talk about these issues and sometimes everything is put on schools to do to fix every social problem. But I think that is a place where we can reach all children and it needs to start young in age appropriate ways, but we need to start talking to children every year. You know, the research shows that a sort of a, a one-time thing is not really gonna help in the long term, but if we do it every week, and we create situations where people are prepared to call out their peers, and I say call out, um, which is a phrase people don't really like, but to identify these issues when they're happening in their peers mm -hmm. and to address those and to expect accountability um, from a young age. Um, I think we also need to be very honest in how we talk about relationships. Um, High school students, middle school students are very good when they're uh, calling and identifying things that aren't true. Mm -hmm. um, so when we sugarcoat things or we don't talk about what relationships really involve and we're not talking to them on a level they can understand or respect, then we're not going to make change. But I think it, we need to start doing that work in our schools, in our faith communities, everywhere, and so that we're reinforcing the idea of healthy relationships so that the whole community can move towards that because it's gonna be harder to do later on. Absolutely, I mean, if you look at the CDC's numbers from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, 10% of high school girls have experienced violence in an intimate partner relationship. And first of all, we have to admit that high school students have intimate partner relationships, mm -hmm. um, but they're reporting high levels of violence from that young age, and that's only gonna carry on and get worse. When we talk about some big changes we've seen this past year, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, overturned Roe v. Wade. That's about 50 years of abortion access precedent. Um, tell us how you see that affecting women in domestic violence situations. We're talking about abortion access and, and, and this feeling of being trapped, essentially. Well, it's a big issue. And it's something that people don't really talk about. When we talk about abortion, abortion access, people will talk about rape exceptions, limited mm -hmm. as those are and as damaging as those can be. But nobody ever talks about reproductive coercion. What happens when women are not allowed to use um, birth control, when things such as stealthing happens, um, when they're um, pressurized to have sex against their will, that happens in violent relationships. It's not as easy as if you don't, 
if you don't want to be pregnant, don't have sex. For women who are in violent and coercive relationships, that's not a choice that they have. And so removing their access to abortion care that they need or may need is a further continuation of that abuse. I mean, it really enables batterers to um, get what they want from women. Um, and I think it's very sad when we have sort of the apparatus of the state enforcing that abuse and furthering it. And then you're talking about creating that cycle that we were just talking about trying to break. Yes. I mean, it's very hard to leave a relationship. It's almost impossible when you have you know, three, four, five children. Where are you going to go? Um, the question is often asked, why didn't she leave? And the, answer, the question, I mean, leave and go where? Mm -hmm. You know, we have no affordable housing in our state. It's very hard to find. Um, and there was a report that came out recently that I, mean, I think Charleston, Greenville, and Myrtle Beach are among the um, cities with the highest increases in rent. So we're asking people to leave, people who may not have been able to work, people who don't have any control over their finances, um, people who are living in fear, and the violence may get worse if they leave. You know, we're asking them why didn't they do something instead of looking for solutions for them that might make that possible. So what can women do in those situations right now that if they're watching, if they might know someone who's in a situation like that, what can they do to, to help them when it's so daunting? If it's, somebody, if it's a victim themselves, we would ask them to reach out to one of our member programs in the area in which they live. They can find that number and the services that are offered on our website. Um, there's also the National Domestic Violence Hotline, which can also direct calls if somebody can't find a local program. Um, if it's a friend, we ask that you really take the steps to listen to them, to believe them, to help them find resources, mm -hmm. and to stay in support of them. People might not leave the first time. People might not leave the second time. But to be that sort of rock that they can depend on, someone who's not going to judge them, who's going to uh, understand that they are the expert in their life and will know when it's safe and when they have somewhere to go, just to be there for them. That's what victims need is for somebody to believe them and to help them. And Sarah, we know that domestic violence, it's not just physical, right? There are so many other aspects to this, so many things that people can't see. Um, if you're in a relationship and you maybe experience something, like what, what's the situation there? Do you just automatically say, no, you know, I got hit one time, I'm done. I mean, sometimes it's not that easy to do that, but, you know, how, walk through some of these scenarios where people should start identifying patterns or situations that are just basically trapping them in this situation? It can be very difficult when you first enter a relationship. It can sort of mimic the um, romance that we're all familiar with when we first get into a relationship and you want to be with someone all the time. But as the relationship progresses, if somebody stops you seeing your friends, if somebody stops you seeing your family, if somebody's controlling where you go, if somebody's wanting to check your cell phone, if somebody's taking over financial control of you. These are all things that should be red flags for you. Um, violence doesn't always happen on an ongoing basis. You know, sometimes violence only ever has to happen once. And then you know as a victim that if you disagree with that person again, that that threat is always hanging over you. Um, what people don't go out on a first date, somebody hits them and they can decide to continue that relationship. You know, oftentimes the violence starts later once you're emotionally involved in that relationship, when it's hard to leave. Um, but keep a lookout. Mm -hmm. If you do see worrying signs, try and find somebody to talk to. Come to, as I said, you, you could call one of our member organizations and talk through a safety plan with them. Um, we know it can be difficult to leave. We know that sometimes when you are um, physically abused, you'll, there'll be lots of apologies and it will never happen again, those kind of things. But it probably will. This is a cyclical um, kind of um, problem in relationships. Mm -hmm. um, but we just want people to know that there is help, there is hope, and that you can find your way to safety and peace again. And with just about a minute left, Sarah, I want to ask you just what needs to be done maybe on the state level when we talk about legislation? Is it more funding or is it just better preventative awareness like you're talking about in schools or in other places? What needs to be done to tackle this in your opinion? I think the most helpful thing that could be done is a really big investment from the state in prevention education and making sure that's available in communities across the state always more funding for services. You know, and you hope in the long run, if you invest in prevention, that the need to invest in intervention will decrease. But um, right now we need heavy investments in both because we have a serious problem here that according to the Jamie Kimball Foundation, who published a report last year, costs our state $352 million a year. Hmm. Yeah, so definitely, like you're saying, prevention could really help us out in the long run there yes. too, but sometimes 
unfortunately we don't take the best advice. No, yeah. it can help us in crude economic terms and in the in the um, just the way people live and the happiness that they can experience mm -hmm. in their homes. Well, thank you so much, Sarah Barber. She's the director of the South Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Always good to see you. Thank you, Gavin. Joining me now to discuss mental health in schools is Jeff Lyritz. He's the director of communications at the Department of Health and Human Services. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you, Gavin. Thanks for having me. So, Jeff, let's start by talking about uh, this executive order that the governor issued earlier this year for DHHS to perform a comprehensive review of the Department of Mental Health's school mental health services program. Uh, what prompted this review? What did it find? So, we had heard, um, obviously, an anecdotally with the governor's office as well, um, a, a lot of concerns and, um, you know, to the level that it wasn't really anecdotal anymore um, with lack of mental health access to uh, lack of access to mental health services in, in schools in South Carolina. So at the at the governor's direction, um, both in his executive order and in his uh, state of the state address, we looked into the um, mental health program that, that's operated in South Carolina schools that, um, you know, that was really um, operated by the, the Department of Mental Health and found that there was only a um, mental health counselor in about every other school in South Carolina, about 50% of schools, and that the ratio of mental health counselors to students in South Carolina was about one counselor for 1,300 students. We um, are, have worked and have actually already implemented several things that we think will help us bring that ratio down to one in about 625, um, about 650, we're trying to cut that in half in this year and ensure that there's access to a mental health counselor in every school in the state. And we have a, a long-term goal to cut that in half again, to get down to about one in every 325. So Jeff, you're talking about, um, you heard anecdotally, is that is that what you're talking about? Then you did this review and you found out just how shocking these statistics were when it's you know one out of 1300 essentially? That's right, the, the governor uh, directed us to, to perform a review to look into this program um, and that's, um, that's what prompted the, the, this effort and um, has prompted the actions that, that we've taken that we think are going to help us get to that, that short-term goal over this year and the, the longer-term goal um, over the next several years. So just, Jeff, how did we get to this point where we, you know, have, you know, we have all this uh, mental health awareness, but there's been discussions about it. Um, you know, thankfully we haven't had a major mass shootings at schools. There have been some incidents over the years, but in light of those situations, both here and nationwide, there's always discussion about more mental health access. But when we talk about this, this ratio of student with counselors to students, uh, it's kind of shocking. So how do we get to that point? Well, thanks, Gavin. And um, I, I'm actually going to address one of the things that you brought up there um, with, with school safety. We, uh, we absolutely view this as something that's important to school safety. Um, it's important to meet those unmet needs um, of poor children for the sake of that child. But there's absolutely a school safety component of this as well. Also a, a productive environment um, component of this where we have uh, children that are acting out because they have behavioral health needs that aren't being met. Um, they're, they're likely causing a distraction for the other children that are in that classroom and, and for the teacher. Um, but um, back to how we got here, we, um, this is a, an issue that, that has existed long before COVID, uh, the issue of adolescent mental health. Um, but we've act, absolutely seen an, an increase of it, um, of the demand um, that's related to the pandemic. Um, you can look at the, the data that um, um, ties back to that. So if there is a silver lining um, with, with COVID, it's that it's brawn, drawn much needed attention to this issue. Um, we were also fortunate here in, in South Carolina that, that schools were open um, that next year. They were open for the, uh, by, by and large, were open for the calendar year, um, school calendar year of 2020 and 2021. Um, we've seen this issue is, is not local to South Carolina or not just to South Carolina. It is certainly something that we view here, but You've seen really off the charts um, numbers of mental health needs um, for students and learning loss for students, um, particularly in states that, that essentially remain closed for that next year. Mm -hmm. So Jeff, when we, we talk about trying to half that number of one counselor to every 1,300 students, you're trying to get to 750, 650. Um, can you tell us about how you're attacking this, what's being done uh, in the short term to try and get that number in half? Uh, absolutely. So. Before um, before our audit, the um, most schools received most schools had a mental health counselor that was part of a contract with the state's Department of Mental Health. Um, as we were just talking about, we've seen an increased um, demand for uh, mental health needs in schools, but we'd also saw a decreased supply of mental health counselors. We saw 
a lot of counselors that were leaving the field, uh, we were paying DMH um, a rate that that would have supported um, a counselor salary that was about double what they were um, offering as a, a starting salary for counselors. Um, but we were also um, paying a DMH um, affiliated counselor significantly more than a counselor um, if a school went out and hired their own mental health counselor or contract with a private counselor. So we've gotten rid of that rate disparity. Um, we're increasing, and, and by doing that, we're investing a lot more money in the school um, mental health counselor program. Um, and we're giving schools a lot more flexibility to go out and hire their own counselor or to go contract with a private counselor to, pre to perform those services in a school or continue along with DMH or uh, do an, uh, an all of the above approach, some sort of hybrid where they might hire their own counselor and they also may contract with a private counselor or with DMH. Um, we're, we're really still fairly early into the school year, um, but we, those rates went into effect July 1st, so they went into effect ahead of the school year uh, beginning, and we've already seen some preliminary, uh, promising preliminary information. Last year, we had uh, 14 school districts in the state that hired uh, their own counselor or that had their own mental health counselor that was a school employee. We've seen 30 districts that have um, that have told us that that's the route that they want to go just for the school year. Um, that's that's an intent. It's not um, not schools that have already gone out and hired their own counselor, but that's uh, a promising early number, and uh, hopefully will get us um, along the path that we want to go um, in in giving schools more flexibility to really taking all of the above option there in terms of um, being able to increase access to these vital services. So Jeff, when we look at the need for these counselors and, and funding situations, obviously we had you know just record amounts of money flowing through the budget this past year. Uh, it's my understanding that there was some money slated for, for this need. What ended up in the final budget that got to the governor's desk and, and how is that money getting pushed out? So a, a lot of what we have done um, with, with the additional money that we, that we have for this is, is that rate increase, is increasing the rate um, that um, counselors are able to reimburse or are able to be reimbursed for performing mental health services in the school. And um, uh, we've also contracted with the psychology, school psychology at the University of South Carolina, and they have developed the South Carolina Behavioral Health Academy, uh, which is available at scsbha.com um, or scsbha.org. Um, and that is um, also to provide schools with resources in not just giving them flexibility and, and saying, okay, you can go, you now have more op opportunities to hire your own counselors, um, good luck. It's um, also helping them integrate um, mental health counseling into their day-to-day -day operations, making sure that those resources are available um, for our, our school or for our students and our families and our schools. And Jeff, then also you're talking about that program at USC, is that creating a pipeline also of, of counselors perhaps to get out uh, and not only in the state, but hopefully into the schools. I mean, how are we incentivizing the next generation of counselors when we're talking about there being such a deficit and then, you know, just the need to get trained up in the first place? Uh, absolutely. We think that that's a, a um, well, the, that $3.2 million um, grant is is to stand up this academy. Um, we're not going to be able to get to our long-term goal of one counselor for every 300 students if there's not an increased pipeline of um, of people entering this field. So. We think that that partnership is is really an important part of this as well, um, but a lot of it again gets back into increasing the reimbursement rate, increasing the um, this which has a trickle down effect of increasing the salary that um, you're able to make as a um, mental health professional performing services in a school setting. And it's my understanding that not all the counselors are licensed in the state. Are they? Is that what does that translate into? I mean, are they still? maybe up to snuff when it comes to professional certificates? What's the difference between not being licensed in the state and being licensed in the state? So that, that, that's correct. Um, DM, uh, counselors that are employed by the state's Department of Mental Health are not required to be licensed. Um, they are um, required to have a master's degree in, in a relevant field and are required to go through other uh, training, but they're not required to be licensed like a private um, employed counselor is. Part of the, um, the work that we're doing with SBHA is a um, is training for counselors um, to hopefully increase um, not just the availability of counseling and the um, integration of um, schools being able to provide these services um, because it's a part of their their day to day operations, but is also to improve the uh, quality of counseling. Um, there's a three tiered approach um, that will be available in the curriculum that that's being developed through SBHA, 
They have an overview module um, that is available on their website now that's available for anybody who works for a school district. It doesn't have to be a, a um, counselor, but it's available to support staff, it's available to teachers, it's available to school leadership and principals and vice principals. Those other three tiers are really geared towards mental health professionals to improve the uh, quality of care um, that, that's available as well. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, really quickly, we have 30 seconds. Can I just ask you about the state of uh, psych beds available in the state? Uh, we're hearing from Robbie Kerr, the director of DHHS, that you know there were more beds available 20 years ago than there are now. Any idea about how many operational psych beds are in the state and how you guys are addressing that problem? 30 seconds. So we're also given some money by the General Assembly, some one-time money to look at the the end-to-end -end behavioral health landscape in the state. And one of the things that we're looking at is um, is being able to triage people who are uh, receiving mental health care um, that right now they're receiving that care in an emergency room. That's not the ideal setting. Uh, we're, we're looking at ways to look at that um, end to end spectrum of care from when somebody first is able to to access treatment to to people who um, who are, are needing to be in a, in a um, facility uh, where they have additional psychiatric needs. So we're, we're looking at that with the one time money that we've received from the General Assembly and, and really looking at building that infrastructure. Um, around that with a longer term goal of, of making sure that there's uh, care throughout that continuity. Gotcha. Yeah, a lot of needs out there right now, especially when it comes to mental health in the state. That's Jeff Lyritz. He's Director of Communications at the State Department of Health and Human Services. Jeff, thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Gavin. And tune into ETV October 26 at 7 p.m. for the only gubernatorial debate in South Carolina between incumbent Republican Governor Henry McMaster and Democratic challenger Joe Cunningham. I'll be moderating with the Post and Courier's Andy Shane. Also, to stay up to date throughout the week, check out the South Carolina Lead. You can find it wherever you find podcasts and on SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.